as props too. You know, I'm sitting up here looking at everybody, and we have an amazing church. You know, we have a, a wide variety of eclectic hodgepodge of people. Amen. Amen. You know, it's just like the hodgepodge. <laughs> We have an amazing group of people, just like the Lord. You know, the Lord, there's, our body is our body. We have many facets to our body. The Lord's the same way. When we get to heaven, the Catholics aren't going to be on one side of heaven. Come on. The Pentecostals aren't going to be on the other side of heaven. We're going to all be together. Yeah. Well, you know, our pastor's been talking about grace. We had a teaching a while back on grace that it kind of stuck with me. So what I'd like to share with you on what I've been studying on grace. Grace brings life. Say grace brings life. Grace brings life. More than you know, there's things that go on when we get when we come into an understanding of what grace is exactly. The word grace translated is Charish. Translated from Greek, charish. Undeserved, unmerited favor and mercy. Undeserved. Undeserved. Say, undeserved. Undeserved. You cannot work for grace. Yes. Amen. You cannot say, look at me, God, I've done this, I've done this, I've, I've abstained from this. Right, right. Unmerited, unfair, unmerited, in favor and mercy. It's just grace. It's brought us into a special relationship with the Lord. Through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The temple veil. The temple veil was 60 feet tall and 4 inches wide. It's a pretty good size. That's like blackout curtains. <laughs> blackout curtains we can do in Arizona. Amen? So this was no simple sheet that was covering the Holy of Holies. That was covering where God dwelt. When Jesus died on Calvary, it says that the temple veil was ripped in two. Straight down the middle. From top to bottom, the moment he died. So what that did was that brought communion to God. God left that area and no longer abode there, if that's the right word. So he left. We never, we, that meant we do not have to go there to ask for somebody else to bring our sins to the Father. That, that, that connection or that um, division was broken and the connection was there. The connection was there. Grace appears 170 times in the Bible, and 131 are in the New Testament. So the Old Testament didn't really talk about grace too much. It was like 39 times it appears, and the rest is in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 4.10. No, wait. Let me go pick up the Bible. I didn't hear no chef in the <laughs> I got it right here. For, there, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Because we trust in the living God. We trust in who? The living God. Okay, the living God. Who is the Savior of some men? All men. All men. Especially those that believe. Yes. That's the most important part of the scripture. He's the Savior of all men. No matter who you are, or who you believe in, or who you think you believe in. But he's the Savior of all. All means all. All. Especially those that believe. That's the important part, especially those that believe. So when we tap into that grace, you know, we get that unmerited favor, then we build that relationship with him because we believe. The majority of the church or religion today has this elitist or beggar's mentality. Where again, we have to not cut our hair to get into heaven. Or we have to speak in tongues only to get into heaven. We put stipulations. We're telling Jesus that his blood was not enough. Come on, that's good. Yes. What we've done, now this was, you know, when I got this, I had to stop and I was like, oh Lord, let me go back and underline this next one. <laughs> we've created a spiritual veil of division. The yeah. very veil that was ripped in two, yeah. we put right back up. Yeah. Yes. Now we have a spiritual veil that we battle with. Humanity has an unhealthy history of taking one step forward two steps back. Amen. Amen. Good example is uh, the Hebrews that were freed in Egypt. Spent all this time in bondage, slavery, just, you know, the worst of conditions. So when they went into the desert, they began to moan, they began to complain. They even began to go back to worshiping what they knew in Egypt was the false idols. When they spent all the time being punished, 
because of that. When it was time to enter into the promised land, they said, no, we're not ready. No, 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 no. We're not ready to go into the promised land. See, we're used to living in misery. So we want to sit in stagnant and walk. Does that fail? John chapter 1 and 17 says, For while the law was given through Moses, yes. great, grace, black, <laughs> grace, and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's right. There were 613 letters to the law. I mean, some of them were kind of ridiculous. You know, not planning to mix vegetables in the same garden, not wearing silk and cotton. <laughs> and these were punishable by death. Yes. <laughs> you, you know, crossed over some of these laws. So then what Jesus did was Jesus, the reformer, Jesus came and fulfilled the law. He was the filler of the law. So what mankind failed on, the man Jesus achieved. Amen? Amen. It's kind of like when you, um, I look at the Jesus and the Moses, as a new boss takes over. You know, we have this oppressing boss that we work under. Nobody really likes the boss. But yet all of a sudden we get a new boss that comes in. Then you have those few in the office, you know who they are. If you don't know who they are, it might be you. Those few naysayers in the office sending the emails well, we didn't do this when so-and-so was around or, you know, when, you know, just, you know what I'm talking about. There, there's always somebody that pushes against the grain, and you know, they usually end up leaving, usually most of the time. Also, at my job. I work with, uh, part of my job description is asking and getting information from people, like their emails. Oh, Lord, don't ask somebody about their email. I don't do computers. I like paper. <laughs> With all that computer and all that technology, I like paper. We'll stay where you are. That's what I want to say. We'll stay where you are. That stagnant, stagnant water. There's no life in stagnant water. <laughs> One of my prayers to the Lord recently has been, Lord, keep my water flowing. Yes. I, I never want to get to that point in life to where I made it. I'm here. I'm never going to go anywhere else from this point because I've arrived and I've made it, which is absolutely ridiculous. You're keeping yourself stagnant. There's water. Water brings life. Amen. Grand Canyon was a creek. It was a creek. That moving water has formed it and shaped it and molded it into what it is today. Then we have water that's in caves. There's been water that I've been in caves for like thousands of years. This water has been doing nothing. There's no life. There's no growth. It's actually poison. Stagnant. I don't want my water. What, what kind of water do you have? What kind of water do you want? Growing, always fresh, always fresh water. Movement. The Apostle Paul, in a lot of his writings and teachings in the Bible, when you read his writings specific, you have to wonder why he was writing like that, who he was writing to. And some of his um, writings was a tough sell to a lot of the people that he was, a lot of the churches that he was sending letters to. And one of them is the book of Hebrews. These were Christ-believing Jews. Now, when you read the book of Hebrews, he's actually speaking to Christ-believing Jews, the new ones, the ones that came around and said, yes, Lord. By the way, which was a perfect ending song today for me, I said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Finally. Anyway, so he was preaching to the Hebrews in Hebrews 4.16. Now this is, I'm going to read the scripture to you, and, you know, it may not mean a lot to you, but think of his audience who he's, you know, a lot of scriptures. Right. Think of the audience who he's speaking to in Hebrews 4.16. He said, and therefore, let us come boldly into the throne of grace, that, me, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, well, yeah, yeah. He said, come boldly. He didn't tell Hebrews that back in the day. Because when they went into the throne room, the holy of holies where God himself dwelt, the priest would bring in your 
praises, your praises, your sacrifice, your your dirt, basically. And if the priest wasn't clean, God would strike him down. And they had a rope tied to his ankle in case they didn't hear the bells, because they had tied bells or sewed bells into their skirt. If they didn't hear the dancing, and they heard a thud, they a jingle, a jingle and a plunk. They would pull him out by his feet because he wasn't even clean enough to go in. He had issues. So they would go in like, you know, you better make sure you have all your dirt taken care of before you go kind of hurt. Because if you know, you pray through one aisle, then you're going to be out, right? You got to get somebody else. They don't want to go in there either. So you know, they were going meekly. So he's telling them, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of glory. Boldly. And they're like, what? Really? Meekly? So equated to traveling to Saudi Arabia and telling the men that their women are equal to them. Okay, uh, you will be stumped. <laughs> a lot of the church today is guilty of playing the gift of grace. They turned it into a stipulated grace. I had to ask pastor, is that a word, stipulated? Yeah, let me get a spell check back, so yeah, stipulated grace. <laughs> a stipulated grace. A grace where you you can get this, but you know, you gotta do this, you gotta say this little rhyme here. You gotta abstain for this, you gotta work for God's love. There's a difference between working and living in His love, amen? Amen. Yes. When you live in that love. When you live in that love, you move and you grow. It's not that we got this good grace thing now so we can cut up, pray about it later. It's a difference between living in it and moving and growing your water and just taking it for granted. A lot of the church today, or not a lot of the church today, though, <laughs> um, in the U.S., the United States, slavery was abolished. New Year's Day, 1863. <clears throat> There's this little small town in Galveston, Texas. They didn't get the memo. Oh, I believe they got the memo. <laughs> like the church, we got the memo. Come on, we just can't good. give it to you yet because you're not ready for it. Because we say so, not because God says so, but because if we let you know the real truth, then, you know, back in the church, grace, I got it, I can do what I want, ask the Lord to forgive me. But so what happened now in Galveston, Texas was they didn't tell their slaves until 1865. From 1863 to 1865, they were living in oppression and slavery. Didn't know it. Mel was slow back then, but not that slow. We can't tell them yet. We cannot tell them yet. They can go. The church has that same mentality. A gift is a gift. You don't get to the eternal and realize what? You mean I had to live like I, I lived like that and I didn't have to? Right. Right. I mean I was just, I lived without. Yeah. Some people really live without, and then they get to the other side and they're like, you know, wow. You mean I could have cut my hair? <laughs> I could have had a beer. <laughs> right? I keep that one in my hair. Right. So Romans another scripture. Romans six four. Now this. This is a good one, and it's three. And I didn't. I put one in, and I said, like, "Well, I gotta go for the next one." And then I was like, "Wow, I'm gonna get a lot of kickback off this chapter 15." And they're gonna say, "We'll read the next one all the way to the end," because you know you can quote a scripture and make a whole doctrine out of it, but then not read what's underneath or what's next. And then it means nothing. Right. 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 So, Romans 6, 14, 15, and we're going to skip to 23. I got to pick my Bible up this morning. I'm typing in, so you know, I'm running out of paper on my laptop. Okay, 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Amen. So all them 613 laws, out the door. Because of Jesus. Then 15 says, this is a good one right here. 
this goes with what the other what the church says also oh, then we just got a, a license to sin because of grace no. well Paul's very clear with this next one he says what then I could just hear the sarcasticness it might even be a roll of the neck <laughs> Because we are not under the law, but under grace, winding it up the whole time. Then he says, God forbid. And then he goes in and explains. And then the very last one in this chapter, 6, is 23. Now, this is where they would say, this is what they would say. And be smug about it. When I say they, I mean church. You know who you are. <laughs> For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. That word sin is not a carnal sin. It doesn't mean of offense. That's what they would say. But then when you get into the word and the meat and potatoes of it and dissect it and wonder where this word and how that word was translated, in the Greek, the word sin was translated in this particular verse, because there's two different, there's the defense, and then there's missing the mark. Huh. This one was missing the mark. That's right. So what happens when we miss the mark? We all have a special place, a special calling where, where we're supposed to go in life. So we're missing the mark. If you read the pack of the cigarettes, it says, warning, smoking this will kill you. Glory. You're Glory. missing the mark. Plain and simple, I'm not saying that smoking is wrong, that's a guilty pleasure. That's fine if that's for you. But it's just, that's, we're missing the mark. There's all kinds of things that we do in life that we're not supposed to do, but we miss the mark. Yes. So that changes the whole thing. So again, it says, closed it. So now you have to read it with that kind of a mentality, not a sin mentality. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, I wanted to equate this with, you know, when we already know now we don't have a license to sin, and then that we have this grace, undeserved, unmerited, with God. And I had to think of it as a parent and a child, with my mom and dad. I was a rotten kid. <laughs> rotten. <laughs> I gave my mom and dad so much grief and so much drama. They loved me. I didn't have a relationship with them. Oh, but they still loved me. And I didn't care. <laughs> I did what I did. I was living outside of their, you know, what they wanted for me, but that love still was there. They had to let's cut me off because they loved me, but they never stopped loving me. So after I grew up, and I realized, you know, I, I called my mom and I really thanked her for always sticking there and being a mother, as mothers are natural, isn't it? Yes. There's nothing like my mom said, my love for you is unconditional. Well, well. I may not always be happy with you, but it's unconditional. Yeah. So then when I, you know, as I've grown and now I'm living right, I respect my mom and dad, and it's all different now. So I live to, I have that relationship with them. Like what happens when you get a relationship with the Lord? And you understand that grace. So when you mess up, you get up, dust yourself off, get a little from your mom and dad, and move and grow from that moment to the next. Not repeat yourself into that same cycle. But if you happen to fall off the horse again, get up. Talk about it with your mom and dad, talk about it with Papa. Yes. Move on in life. That's how a relationship is, and that's how back to the top of my grace brings life. Grace brings life in relationships. Amen. Amen. I must say, it has been a pleasure giving you some work today. <laughs> Thank you.
Just stand to your feet if you would. Those of you who are already standing, remain. Come on, just give it one more hand clap.